And I find myself thinking, it's not just my client that's been badly injured and harmed. So has the earth. And the next thought changed my life. I, saw, I find myself thinking, the earth is in need of a good lawyer. Now, that case I, I won in part. And in fact, it changed employment law at that time. I remember going back to my clerks in the clerks room and they were very excited and they were saying, Miss, Miss, you know, your career is made. Now things can really change for you. You can bounce off anywhere. You can go to another set of chambers. You can really make it big. This case can really help you. And I said, yeah, and I'm off. I choose another path. And it crystallized into a question. My question was, how do we create a legal duty of care for the earth? I could see, as a barrister, that there was missing law here. That as a barrister in a court of law, I didn't have the tools of my trade that I needed to be able to represent the earth in court. Which is truly amazing because I have the legal tools to represent fictional beings. I can represent a corporation in court. I can represent a church in court. I can represent a charity in court. But a living being, a living entity, the earth, I can't. Why is this? And what I realized was, was that actually, in a way, we had to play catch up with our understanding. What I was beginning to understand is that not only was there missing law, but more than that, there was something else missing from within our law. And this was a narrative born of our intrinsic values. What is it that we deeply care about here? Because at the end of the day, law is a tool. It can be used as a, as a greater force for greater good, or it can be used as a tool of significant harm as well. Which way do we choose to use it? So this was also about missing law uh, that addressed our intrinsic values. What do we care about? How do we create a legal duty of care for the earth? If we treat life itself as sacred, then yes, we put in place laws to protect our own lives, but what about the life of the earth? What about the lives of other living beings? That doesn't exist yet. And my starting point was to say to my lawyer friends, you know, I think the earth has the right to life too. I think the trees have rights too. I think animals have rights too but it's not being recognized fully in law. And my lawyer friend said, Polly, you're mad. This is a ridiculous idea. How can the earth have the right to life? So what I did was I started to look out there to find who thought like me. I thought, you know, I can't be the only person thinking like this. I can't really be mad here. If I'm beginning to think that the earth has the right to life, where are those lawyers out there that are creating new laws to protect the Earth's right to life? And I literally I went out across the world trying to find those lawyers. And not just lawyers, non-lawyers as well. And, and what I discovered was that, in fact, there was a whole world of indigenous people out there who think like I do. And not just indigenous people, Buddhists as well got this idea. In fact, for them, this was common sense. So how was it in the Western world there seemed to be this disconnect, this, this lack of understanding? Eventually, I did find lawyers who were engaging with this. And in fact, there's a whole body of earth lawyers out there now. There's a whole global alliance of earth lawyers, which I helped co-found. And they're very active in various countries across the world. But it took a time to try and find these lawyers. And what I discovered was that, in fact, there was a huge conversation going on internationally with these lawyers, uh, what's called Earth Jurisprudence, the theory behind this. 
and it had actually started way back in 1972 in Harvard when a professor, a legal professor, asked his students, what if trees had standing, had legal standing in a court of law? And his students laughed at him. And they probably thought, he's mad. <laughs> I have to say, if people think you're mad, you're clearly onto a good thing here. <laughs> <laughs> Timmy Paul throw that one out. I, but because of that, he went away and thought, well, you know, I need to work this out. What if trees had standing? What if trees had rights too? And this was very inspiring to me because I'd spent time as a student in Vienna with an amazing artist called Hundertwasser, which some of you might have heard of. He was truly remarkable. He, he was an ecologist as well as an artist. He was an architect. He was a philosopher. And he wrote huge tracts as well about trees having rights as tenants on this earth and that we have no ownership over them, only tenureship. We, we, we are stewards, we are guardians, we are trustees of this earth, of this land, of the trees, of the bees, of the birds. And this had all resonated greatly with me as a student, but it wasn't until I became a lawyer that actually it started to come together and make more sense. So I found these lawyers out there, and I wanted to see who was creating the new laws. As someone that was grounded in court work as a barrister, and someone who was representing big companies or employees. So my area was employment law, it was to do with corporations, it wasn't anything to do with environmental law. But what I could see was these people that I got on very well with thought it was absolutely fine to make lots of money out of mass damage and destruction in whatever their industry was. How was it that we had so normalized this process that allowed us to just see it as acceptable within our society to make lots of money out of something that just happened to be very destructive? I'm thinking in particular about the fossil fuel industry here. Somewhere along the line, good people were getting stuck in a pattern in a system and they weren't seeing even that it was harmful as it played out. How have we so normalised that process? In fact, I was talking earlier today in the car I, uh, about I, South Africa and apartheid. And one thing that came up, and I've heard this before from others and friends of mine who lived in Canada, and it wasn't until they left Canada or South Africa that they discovered that there was a huge, significant harm at play there in South Africa, apartheid. Because actually when you grow up in a system and it's your norm, it's very hard to challenge it because sometimes you don't have a vision of what another normative could be. And sometimes you're so shielded from it, it's so accepted as a way of being that you can become complicit in a system that is so harmful without even knowing it. How can this be? A very good friend of mine grew up in Canada and she knew nothing about the Athabasca tar sands in Canada, a territory the size of England and Wales being destroyed over just 40 years. For what? For fossil fuel to feed us on a very short-term basis and yet at the same time vast tracts of ancient arboreal wetlands and peatlands and forests being destroyed day by day. And she didn't even know about it. And she lived very close to that. It wasn't until she came over here that she began to hear about it. So sometimes there is this thing about having to step back to be able to see something through fresh eyes. And to do it also with compassion to recognize that many people are complicit in a system without even realizing it, trapped within something, without <coughs> even knowing that there is an entrapment, if you like. And what I discovered when I took a year out from law 10 years ago was that once I stepped back and gave myself space to think about this problem, how was it that we are stuck in a system that allows this normative to play out. I found myself examining law at a closer level. And very quickly, of course, I discovered that it is the legal duty of a CEO 
and his directors to put the interests of the shareholder first, which means, for most companies, to put profit first. Now that worked for quite some time, but it got to a certain point as industry started to scale up in a very big way when we discovered that actually the consequences of our actions are not accountable in a court of law. One of the areas that I looked at in great depth when I wrote my first book was the oil industry. And for those who, who heard me speak earlier, I forgive you for, for repeating the story, but it, actually it was a very important discovery for me. I was very curious about how the oil industry had become so huge in such a short period of time. Because in fact the oil industry was born just over a hundred years ago. So it's a very short time lifespan. And yet the fossil fuel industry is one of the most destructive industries in the world now. When I went back and I looked, what I discovered was something truly remarkable. The very first oil field that was discovered, major oil field, the biggest in fact in the world, and it still remains the big biggest ever oil field, was in Turnpike in Texas. And that oil field was born of a man who had great vision for a more beautiful world. He saw a world that could be run on the energy from fossil fuel. He saw that this would fundamentally reform transport. No longer would we have to use horses. That we could actually take it into uh, vehicles that could be run on fossil fuel. It could heat our houses. <coughs> he saw cities that would be built on oil. He had a huge grand vision. And people thought he was mad. Of course. But he knew that underneath <coughs> that ground there was oil, and if he just got deep enough, it would spurt out. He had to raise money to do this, and people lost faith in him. He had a very hard time to do this, but he knew if he got down deep enough, he could do it. Has anybody got any idea how deep he had to drill to find that oil field? Any idea at all? 100 meters. 100 meters? No, less. 26, is that what you said? 26 meters. That's very little indeed. Think now we have to drill miles down to extract oil. 26 meters he drilled into the ground and the oil spurted out so fast and so far that it actually hit people's faces two miles away. And they were dancing. This was liquid gold, which indeed it was. There was no sense then of how destructive this would become, of how now we've got into a stage of using excessive amounts of energy, water, chemicals, to now unconventionally extract it and take it out. There was no sense in his vision of the harm that this would play out. But what is so amazing is that man, his name is Patulo Higgins. <laughs> He's an ancestor of mine. Oh. <laughs> Sadly, I didn't inherit any money. <laughs> but maybe I'm having to carry the consequences of his karma, I don't know. But this was really quite amazing for me because also it, it brought home to me how this was a man who didn't understand the consequences of his great vision, if you like. And indeed, fossil fuel has served us so well in so many ways. We wouldn't be where we are today without it. But now we do know the consequences. And we know what the significant harms are and it's playing out. But we don't have the due process to examine that. Because it's not a crime to destroy the earth. So what ecocide law does is it puts in place an international crime that holds to account at the very top level those who make decisions that can cause significant harm, not just to humans, but to nature and also to future generations. Now that may sound like a very grand idea, and in some ways it is, but it's rooted in some very practical legal constructs. 
It's building on existing law that we have, and it's taking it just one step further. And that's very important. When I met, for the very first time, the lawyers that are out there engaging with the philosophy of earth law and what would those laws look like, I was very frustrated that nobody was actually out there creating these laws. There was a lot of discourse about the theory of it, but not the creation. And I ended up, after going around the world trying to find these lawyers, I came full circle back to me and thought, oh, maybe it's up to me to create these new laws. I'm a great believer that the person who has the idea has all the support around them to carry it out. And that's very true. And I'm finding that in my journey that after I proposed ecocide law and fully drafted that and submitted it into the UN Law Commission back in 2010, that in fact, more and more people are coming forward to support this idea, this law, as it moves very fast forward in time and in, in space, in a way. I was just having a chat earlier with someone about how it's as if we are each lighthouses, shining a light, standing up, speaking up as voices for the earth. And that it's a virtual supergrid of light out there. And we connect with each other, and as we do so, we charge up each other so that we can go back out and speak out again. And this, for me, is about how we take charge, literally, of our own lives and engage with the bigger issues of our day. And I can think of no bigger issue for me than actually addressing how do we bring to an end the era of ecocide? How do we bring to an end the significant harm that has become a normative in our world? How do we do that? For me, it's through using law, creating the new laws that allows us to say, enough, no more. This is now a crime. But can we really do that? Well, yes, we can. We've done it before and we will do it again. Because in a way, law is a living being in its own right. It has its own dynamic energy. So it's up to us to choose where we want it to go. We did it back with the abolition of slavery. We did it at that time when we stood up and spoke out and said, enough, no more. William Wilberforce, when he stood up and said, we have to stop treating humans by dint of their colour as commodities. People told him he was mad. You can't do that. It's impossible, they said. It's a necessity. The public demanded to get rid of slavery will lead to economic collapse. Well, not one of those single reasons were borne out. And look at those three reasons. It's a necessity. The public demanded it will lead to economic collapse. What are the three main arguments that are put forward for continuing with fossil fuel today? But what was so amazing is that we can learn from history. What were the lessons that we learned then? Well, one of the things that I do know after studying that is that there is a cycle here at play. From the very beginning of proposing that we outlaw something. The abolition of slavery was the outlawing of slavery. It was the criminalizing of it, making it a crime. So holding individuals to account for it. And that starting point, in fact, started even earlier than William Wilberforce, but he was the one that made it very visible, it came from the Quakers. And it took a period of about 40 years, four decades, until that was realized. The beauty of that is that it was realized within one lifetime. William Wilberforce was just 28 when he famously sat under an oak tree and asked the wisdom of the oak tree, what do I do? I've been asked, I've been called upon to stand up and speak out about slavery and to call for it to be abolished. Do I walk away from this or do I stand up and be a voice for the slaves? Now, when he died, he died two days after the final law was put in place that triggered the abolition of slavery right across the world. He died a happy man. And during that time, it's like a spectrum of time and space, 
But also, what happened with law was very interesting. And we see this not just with the abolition of slavery, we see it with genocide and also with apartheid. And interestingly, we're seeing it with ecocide as well. That over that period of 40 years, it starts with calls for voluntary mechanisms, calling on industry to stop, uh, calling on an ethical imperative. I, in fact, you see it just now with the UN Global Compact, inviting business to do the right thing. It's a voluntary initiative. You had the same with apartheid. You had the same with slavery. And then it gets to a point where they say, OK, now we need agreements. Maybe we need a treaty, an international treaty. Apartheid, there was an international treaty. And all that time, it's getting louder and noisier. People are standing up and shouting and saying, this has to stop. There's a whole divestment movement, people calling that you divest out of slavery, you divest out of apartheid. And then it gets to a point where actually it's getting bigger and bigger. It's almost as if those who really want to keep that system in place become very entrenched. But the noise gets louder and louder around it. What is very interesting with slavery is that cap and trade was proposed. We'll cap this industry and we'll, we'll leave it to market mechanisms. Fines, catch me if you can laws were proposed. Actually, the British government laughed them out of, out of Westminster and said that will never work. And they were right, it wouldn't work. Because it's just a matter of doing it a little less. What finally stops it is when you criminalise the harm. And all that time the narrative is getting stronger, saying blacks have rights too. That's a very strong narrative that ran through the abolition of slavery and apartheid, interestingly. Genocide, ethnic minorities have rights too, but rights don't get you far enough. It's the enforcement of those rights that ensure the governance. It's about putting in place the duties and the obligations, the responsibilities. It's like two sides of a coin. On one side, you have the rights. I have the right to life. You have the right to life. You have lots of other rights and freedoms. But if someone comes along and shoots you, they mean nothing because your most important right, your right to life, has been withdrawn. What governs that human right to life is the crime of murder or homicide in America. And that's the difference between having a fight in the kitchen and picking up that knife that you use to chop vegetables and using it as a weapon and not picking it up at all. Because there are consequences to that action and you will be held to account in the criminal court of law. Because in criminal terms, when malum in se becomes malum prohibita, we have decided that something is so wrong in and of itself, we prohibit it. We get to a point and we say, enough, no more, it is now a crime. We were talking earlier about how Ecuador has enshrined in its constitution the Earth's right to life, but it's not stopping destruction happening in Ecuador. That's because it's not yet a crime. It doesn't have the legal teeth that holds to account at the very top end those who are in positions of power to stop that from happening. And that's what's so crucial. But here's the good news. That 40-year time span has already run. In 1972, Olaf Palma was the head of state in Sweden. And he held the first ever international conference on the environment. And he stood up, he called for ecocide to be recognized as an international crime. In fact, he berated the United Nations for dragging their feet on this issue. And that was 1972. In 1973, a draft convention on ecocide law was submitted into the UN. In 1985 to 1996, a period of 11 years, there was the drafting of possibly the most important document in the world. And that's called the Rome Statute. That's the codification of the existing international crimes into one document and putting in place the International Criminal Court. 
So that was about bringing together genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, adding a fourth one, crimes of aggression in the run-up to war, which was put, uh, put on the table on, in 2010, and a fifth one, ecocide law, as an international crime. I didn't know that when I proposed it into the United Nations in 2010. I had no idea it had this history already. What it does show is that, actually, when an idea has come, it refuses to go away. And the reason I say that is that in 1996, after 11 years of drafting, at a closed-door meeting that had far less people at it than we are here today, it was announced to the Working Group on Crimes Against the Environment that ecocide was going to be removed as a wartime crime and a peacetime crime. Many countries had come on board at that stage and many countries objected to it being removed. No reasons were given and those doors were closed. In fact, the whole Working Group on Crimes Against the Environment was disbanded. And the Rome Statute, when it was put in place two years later, had one missing crime, the fifth international crime against peace, ecocide law. In 2010, when I proposed this, I had no idea of this past history until a journalist got in touch with me and said he'd found one UN document that referred to this. And it was only when I phoned up the United Nations and said I'm looking for a missing document that I discovered just how difficult it is to find anything within the United Nations. Give this a try, if you will. <laughs> Phone the United Nations and ask them for a document to make a side law. And what you get is someone on the other end saying, I have no idea what you're talking about. But every UN document has a reference code on it. And so what you can do is you, you can ask for it through its reference code. Instead, what happened was I had someone on the other end of the, the phone saying, yeah, if you go to our website and you put that reference code in, you can download it off the internet. But the problem is, when I did that, it came up error document unknown, something we're all familiar with. So I explained this and said, you've got a missing link here. And he said, that's not my responsibility. <laughs> well, if not you, then who? Well, okay, he put me on to another department. Sorry, that's not my responsibility. Sorry, that's not my... And this went on for an hour until I ended up coming back to the same guy. I'd gone full circle and nobody would take responsibility for a broken link on the website. <laughs> this was kind of like dealing with the United Nations. You know, nothing was transparent, nobody was being accountable and nobody could do anything about a broken link on the website. So I knew there had to be a better way to get this document. I knew there had to be a basement somewhere that had these documents. But I also knew I needed someone who knew how to look for these documents that had special access. And I used this example um, before I introduced Nicola, and, um, well, in fact, Matt's going to introduce Nicola. I used this as an example of the magic that's happening in my life. Because there is magic at play here, most definitely. And this happens to me time and time again. And not just me, but many people who are involved in ecocide law. That something is bigger at play, if you like. I was invited in by University of London School of Advanced Studies, uh, the Legal School of Advanced Studies, to come in and talk about ecocide law. And I had been thinking for a year, how do I get this document. It must exist. It's, it's like my gold dust. There is something here. This is my ace of cards uh, that will lead me to something more. I didn't know anything about the history. And when I came out of that talk, I was walking down the stairs with Dr. Damien Short, who's an expert, whose students I had been speaking to. He's an expert on genocide law. And I said to him, you know, Damien, I don't know, I feel I should ask you, would you happen to know how on earth I can get my hands on a document, a UN document reference, here's the code that I have. I need someone who can get into the UN basement, if it exists, because there must be a basement somewhere. 
And he said, yeah, sure, Polly, I have special access. I've been going there for three years to do research on the lawyer who put in place genocide. And by the way, I'm going there in two weeks with a whole bunch of students. They've given me special access with them. What do you need? Now, his students came back with two liter arch passes that, that gives the whole history that went back to 1972 in all of Palmer. And in fact, as a result of that, we went public with it, they wrote a research paper. Many people are now involved in this right across the world. And it, it was the gold dust and the gold dust moment. But this is kind of like piecing together a jigsaw puzzle. And I think we're getting to a point where we're just missing the last few pieces. And one of the last few pieces is about those who stand up and call for ecocide law. And the last of the pieces to surround those people are us. We're all part of that jigsaw puzzle. And not just us, but many, many thousands of people right across the world who are engaging in this to help build support and make visible that there's a different way of engaging with the world, standing up and becoming a voice for the earth. So on that note, I'd like to turn over to you, Matt, because there's another voice for the earth here that I would like to invite up here. Thank you, Polly. You're dealing with the